I'm Timothy Luce, and I'm going to show you how to build version 2 of my rocket stove boiler, which I have dubbed the Dragon. I've been using the version 1 of this stove for over a year, and it's been working great. But um, over the year, I've figured out some ways I could simplify the design to make it easier for anyone to build. And I actually think we might improve efficiently slightly through the use of insulative material. And I'm actually going to put it to use in my shop, which I'm also still in the process of building, as you can probably tell from all of the construction debris around. So let's get started. So the basis of this rocket stove boiler is a 55 gallon drum. It gets a propane tank here, which will serve as the burn chamber. That'll connect to two elbows for, or one elbow for the uh, riser tube which will be a normal six inch stove pipe. And I'm gonna pour a little bit of concrete in the bottom to lock everything together. And then um, I will pour vermiculite to insulate everything. The heat exchangers are built by wrapping copper coil around the uh, burn chamber and also the riser tube. That's it. So we've got a generic old propane tank here and the valve has been out of it for years. So there's absolutely no chance there's any explosive gas left in here. If you're not sure, you can always fill the tank up with water, which I've done before on a, on a more fresh tank, but um, there's no chance this one will explode. So I'm gonna fire up the plasma cutter. I'm gonna cut what is the, uh, I guess it's the old bottom off of it because the valve was up here. And we cut the old bottom off of it. This will actually be the top. We're gonna to use this for the base. We're gonna cut a hole here for the stovepipe to go through. So this will be the top. I'm gonna to cut it off here, and I'm cutting it on the, the seam just past the weld. So it's thinner there, and my plan is to actually get rid of all this extra crap off of here and turn this thing upside down and use it as the lid. So we'll see how that goes. but. First step, we're going to get to cutting. This elbow is going to connect to the burn chamber and create the riser tube. So you place the elbow on there and you mark all the way around it. And then we cut it out. Taking care not to cut this part of the tank. Let's see if it looks like it's gonna fit. I cut it tight, because I'd rather have it a little too tight versus a little too loose. Yep, I think that's gonna be perfect. What I'm doing now is drawing the grill or grate structure, if you will. And um, the one that I had previously had openings about this big, and I had no problems with that, with too large of an ash falling through. So, um, I could go with that, but I'm just going with a more symmetrical pattern that's easier for me to cut with a plasma cutter. So I'm basically doing spokes off the center.
What we're doing now is we're cutting this to fit. Because of this uh, bowl here, we've got to notch this and um, make it fit the contour here. So it's going to take uh, just a little bit of cutting and maybe a little bit of hammer work and we'll have it right. So this just comes down to what I call eyeballing it, staring at it and persuading it a little bit. And test fitting and repeating till you get it right. That is a great fit. She's in. So what I'll probably just do now is take the hammer and beat these out around it like a flange to hold it in place. The one thing you do need to keep in mind as you're building is the overall diameter, the combined diameter of these two units. It needs to fit inside the drum. For my drum, it's about 22 inches clearance. So I'm using this top ring to visually demonstrate. If I build it like that, I wouldn't get this in the drum. So I'm going to cut this back basically to continue that crimp that's only like an inch to get it back here so we can drive this in further. I'm cutting about every half inch, maybe five eighths. And then we'll stick it back in place. In case it's not obvious, you want to end up with this plum. So when you run your stove pipe, it's not cockeyed. Right, I'm going to bend a few of those up to hold it while I adjust it and take a measurement. And remember, this is all going to be locked in with concrete, so it shouldn't go anywhere. It should be good now. Close. Pours it in a little bit more. All right, we'll just, just do clear. So all that remains now is to tap these fins out. So the moment of truth. It fits! Funny how math works. So we're about two hours into the build and I need to go ahead and prep the copper tubing for the freeze. So when you create the heat exchangers, the easiest way to keep your copper from kinking is shove it in a water hose, turn the water hose on till water sprays out the other end of your copper and do it with some force so it'll blow any air out of it. Then cap those ends and stick them in a freezer. Of course, right now we're early December, so our temperatures will be below freezing tonight. I'm just going to let it sit out and freeze on its own. Then tomorrow I will wrap copper around this coil, uh, around this burn chamber, and around this riser tube, which this whole thing is upside down right now. So I'm going to wrap copper around this. There will be a stove pipe coming off of this and it will go um, pretty probably all the way up the stove pipe 
we'll probably only go about a third to half of the way up this one. And then these two things have to hook together and all of that I'll show you how to do tomorrow. Here's the copper tubing. I'm gonna put a water hose here. Try not to get myself soaked in the process, but I'll probably get a little bit wet. Blast water out this side. When I see water coming out this side solid, I know I'm good. I'll throw the hose down, put a cap on either end, and then we'll do the next one. got the rough fabrication done on the burn chamber. We've got our outlet for our riser tube in. What I want to do is actually lower this into the drum to make sure I've got enough clearance for the copper uh, heat exchanger that goes around this. One thing I did not consider fully last night was I really would like to make sure this uh, copper, the copper coil that gets wrapped around here for the heat exchanger does not make contact with the outer sidewall because that will make it work more efficiently and theoretically over time it could prevent some wear on the copper through expansion and contraction. So ideally um, I would move this about another quarter of an inch this way. Uh, there is a balancing act though because we also want to get a copper coil around this side and the copper coil is a half inch outside diameter. We've got about an inch and a quarter spacing here. So when we wrap this copper coil around and this copper coil around, we want to make sure that we don't make it too crowded. So. I'm going to try and knock that in just a little bit more. All I need is about another quarter of an inch and we should be good. So before I try to um, insert this in just a little bit further, I'm putting a mark around it with some soapstone. I use soapstone when I'm working with metal because it shows up better than most things. On some stuff like stainless steel or bright metal, it's better to use like a Sharpie or something, but when it's rusty and old or dark, this soapstone works great. This seam right here is going to create a sharp point that could cut into the copper, so I'm just going to grind it smooth. Make 
made short work of that one. The next step is to wrap this burn chamber with copper tubing. So I'm going to be running around it, doing laps, coiling it, and you got to work pretty quick. It's just above freezing now, so I have a lot more time than I would like I did the last time in the summertime. But in order to hold this thing in place, I'm just going to knock this support in place and wedge it against the door opening here, which is made of concrete. And that should hold everything nice and stiff while I'm working on it. Let's make a heat exchanger. This is half inch OD copper. Found that three quarter is too stiff and it's not enough metal to water ratio to really get a good exchange. But half inch does great and fill it full of water, stick it in a freezer or let it sit outside overnight if you have freezing temperatures. The ice will keep it from kinking. Let's go. So, you could put a pressure relief valve if you want, but the tank I had had a huge volume of air in it, and I'm going to stop there, because I'll probably run this tube up and out. Should be a hammer kicking around here somewhere, right there. I just told us. Yeah, just don't let it slide back in. Your hands will freeze. But... So I'm anchoring this off in position with some wire. So, cold water goes in at the bottom here, makes its loop around. For this design, I'm going to use compression fittings, uh, flare fittings rather, to connect the two heat exchangers together inside the stove body. The first stove that I built, I used rubber outside of the stove body to connect the two copper sections together. Works perfectly fine, but you lose a little bit of efficiency when you have that hot water brought outside of the stove to the environment. So now that I've proven that this design works and the overall design has not changed in terms of the heat exchangers, I'm just changing the insulation around the heat exchangers with this simplified version two. So, this is going to be inside a 55 gallon drum. We'll pour concrete up to about here, something like that, to seal everything down here. And then what I'll do is connect the stove pipe, which will have a heat exchanger around it, to this heat exchanger um, over here on this side. 
And as we do that, um, after we've done that, we're going to fill this stove up to the top of the 55 gallon drum with vermiculite to insulate all this it should keep it super heated and uh, increase the efficiency overall of this stove design. This will protrude out of the top of the 55 gallon drum as will the um, stove pipe. So essentially other than fuel going in and gases coming out this will be contained inside a single 55 gallon drum. Now we're going to make the riser tube heat exchanger. Here we go, making the riser tube heat exchanger. And here we go again. Stop there and bend it up. And we'll tie it off. You can see we deformed the stovepipe a little bit, mainly because the anchor I had at the bottom here slipped off, and so the copper started spinning around. But that can be straightened out. So I just put this over top of an old fence post that was already in the ground and tied it off to it to hold it steady while I ran laps around it like a crazed gerbil. Here's essentially how it goes together. This will fit in there. Smoke and hot gas will come out of this guy. Fire will burn in there. Water will get pumped through these coils, and out comes hot water. Here's how the flow of this is going to work. This section is going to pr protrude outside of the stove, and there will be a connection here. Water will be pumped in, and it will spiral all around. And then on the back side of this, this one points back down to connect to the spiral here and it'll connect at the bottom. So where those two interface, we will have a flared connection. So water will pump in and it'll go through the firebox first, which will sort of preheat it, and then it will hit the riser tube second. The riser tube is where the main heat output happens. So we're preheating here, and then we do the final second stage heat here. So the next part of the process is to insert the riser tube heat exchanger, which is basically comprised of, as you've seen, stovepipe and copper wrapped around it. And so I've made this wire. I'm going to put it in here, get it in place, and then use the wire to hold it while I fiddle with it.
So right at that elbow, we've got the copper lined up where those two are going to meet. So I'm going to start working on that fitting next. The fittings we're using for this part are pretty simple. There are two of these half inch flare nuts. And what happens with that is you slide this on the copper and then you use a flare to, tool to flare out this copper. And that allows you to get a metal on metal watertight seal without the use of any sealants or um, Teflon tape or anything like that. So it's a watertight seal and if you ever need to take it loose you can. You don't have to deal with solder. So the part number for the long piece here which is the flare union, this guy right here. The part number for that is 754042-08. It also has the number FLF7402 half union. And I don't know the manufacturer on that. The flare nuts are by Watts and it's A-260C. And I can't see what the camera's filming right now. I'm doing this solo, so hopefully those showed up good enough for you guys. So we're gonna take the pipe cutter. We basically need to allow for the width, the length, whatever you wanna call it, of, let me open this plastic bag with my gloves on. So we basically need to cut off enough to make this work here without a lot of excess. We've got some play that we can use as needed. Now we're going to go ahead and start the flare process, which is actually really simple. I'm going to tighten down this side first because I'll get more leverage on the open end if I tighten it last. To use the flare tool, you clamp this on and this slides on and turns on like a 45 degree angle to lock. Then you come over this way and you just screw this down and it starts to flare out the copper. And we have a trouble free fitting once we tighten that down. We are about four and a half, five hours in so far to the build. And it's starting to make sense. Now we're going to go ahead and dry fit this puppy in the 55 gallon drum, make the hole for the fitting, and essentially get ready to pour concrete. That's essentially what this mugger is going to look like. Looks like some kind of steampunk still. So the next step is to get ready for concrete. And what I mean by get ready for concrete, we want to have an inlet for the air. This stove should be able to burn in downdraft mode where it gets air from the top once it gets going or from here. Haven't proven that yet, but I think it will. But Generally, you're going to be burning mainly through an inlet nozzle. So, um, I, I may end up doing two inlets here. Uh, I'm going to start with just one that I actually end up using as an ash clean out. And 
We'll see how that works. If it ends up not working, I'll do the 45 degree inlet like I did on the last stove. Um, something that could cause it to not work is the air will be entering under the burn point, which might make it a little harder to get it started. And once it gets going, it'll be fine. Um, another thing that make, could make it not burn well is if ash falls and obscures the, obstructs the inlet. But I'm gonna start with one inlet and then we'll take it from there. So I'm just drilling a pilot hole and I'm basically lining up in a 90 degree orientation with the riser tube. Switch down to low speed on this drill. cut a opening and a tongue so that we can make this air divert up into the fire. So I don't know how well you can see that, but what I did was create a lip there that will direct the air upwards toward the fire. dot right here so I know which way is up because I'm going to have this thing where it's removable. Right, now we make the hole for the tubing to come out. Put it right about there. Next up, I'm mixing concrete. We're going to pour it in there, and I'll find a way to keep this thing warm overnight so the concrete can set, and then we will start a fire tomorrow. I've got the concrete mixed and um, pouring it into it. I started with two bags and we'll see if that's enough. Alright, it is cold out here and I don't want this concrete to freeze. So I'm going to light a torch and let it blow in the inlet. So the sound you hear there is my torch, which I'm using to keep the concrete from freezing. And now I'm going to go ahead and tap the, the barrel to get the concrete to settle. <clears throat> you don't have to tap it hard. Wow, 
while I'm doing this, I can see the concrete wiggle and settle. And basically, I'm going to keep doing it until it stops settling. I'll show you what we have. Concrete has stopped settling as I tap it. And around this side. And then we'll look down the throat here. And I don't know if you can see, but I was just making sure that none of it was seeping around the edge, the bottom rim, and it isn't. One thing I am happy to see is, well, if it'll focus for me, this right here, you can see the concrete has oozed out just a little bit there, which is good. There we have it. And around six hours we have finished all of the heavy fabrication fabrication and the only thing that's left to do is hook this thing up to plumbing and let the concrete cure of course next thing we're going to do is pour vermiculite in here to seal it and i'm to insulate it i may not even try to put the top on it it's probably not even going to be needed so that's really all we have to do today apart from get a fire going in it to keep the concrete from freezing. So um, I estimate another half an hour or so tomorrow um, max and we'll, we'll be done with it. So this is easily something you could bust out in a Saturday. I started late yesterday, um, only worked around two hours and started in the afternoon today. So it's easily something you could bust out on a Saturday and get it done. Uh, total cost to date is $200, not counting the antifreeze that I'm gonna put in. I am gonna put antifreeze in this because I'm not gonna have the stove running all the time during the winter and I don't want it to freeze. So um, the antifreeze was around 40 bucks <clears throat> for four gallons and I'm gonna mix it half and half with water. And um, we'll see how much more water I need to do beyond that. Uh, I may need a bit more thinking I may end up around 20 gallons when it's all said and done. I'm not going to have a 330 gallon heat storage like I do at the house because this is basically an instant on system. I will need to size the water in such a way that I don't start making steam. So ultimately that's going to determine the volume of water that I use. So we've got a little bit of plumbing to do tomorrow and this puppy is ready to rock. So I'm excited to see what it does. I would never have done this stove without testing it if I was doing it as the first build, but I have no problem pouring concrete and letting it set. I'm that confident in the design. So uh, total cost I have in it so far, this was free, this was free. Plumbing, which I bought locally, I could have probably got it cheaper online. I do like to support local business. Um, I have just over $200 in it, not like 204 or something, not counting the uh, antifreeze, which uh, is going to be somewhere between 40 and 80 bucks, depending on how many gallons I need. So there you have it. I hope this is helpful. Show me what you built. I'm interested in seeing what other ideas people have for this. You could use this as a domestic water heater. Um, you would obviously want to monitor the temperature and make sure you're not um, making water that's going to burn somebody. But I found the easiest way to do that is just have a giant tank um, because the tank moderates the temperature swings. Um, the stove can be putting out 160 degree water and it takes it a while to heat that um, 30, 3, uh, 330 gallon tank up that I have at the house. So. Uh, but I am interested in seeing what other people build. It's definitely a learning endeavor, and I am happy to share what I know, but there's a lot of smart people out there who come up with better ways of doing things. So 
Um, I'm excited to see what people do with this. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it.